He had had enough. They'd known each other for years, grew up together, studied in the same schools, traveled in the same social circles. He had quietly listened to Yehuda as he waxed on about how incredible their society is. The economy is booming, he exclaimed. Look at all of our infrastructure improvements, our water, it's never been cleaner. It was then that Simon Shimon could no longer stay silent. Are you kidding me, he exploded the blood rushing to his face. It suddenly got very awkward for everyone in the room. His veins were bulging, the spittle exploding from his mouth. Shimon was in disbelief that someone he spent so much time with could hold such a naive view of the world. Shimon was convinced that their government only did that which benefited the people who were in power and did very little to improve the lives of those who were lacking. Their motivation, he thought, was growing their power, not growing their compassion. After this encounter, Yehuda went home to his family and described what had happened with Shimon. He too was in disbelief that they could see the world so differently. He mostly just wanted an ear to listen as he processed what he felt was an unreasonable amount of anger in his friend's response, trying to make sense of what had happened. From there, the news of the incident spread like wildfire throughout their community. Every household was debating who was right and who was wrong, who had a valid argument, and who was completely irrational or even insane. Eventually, the episode made its way to the ears of the government leaders, who then had the task of deciding how to address Shimon's slandering of them. Now, you may not be surprised that this is where I reveal that this story actually comes from our Talmud and took place around the second century of the Common Era. As you can probably predict, the way the Roman Empire decided to handle it was by issuing a decree that Shimon was to be put to death. And so he, along with his son, Eleazar, went into hiding. They had to save themselves. As the Talmud describes, together, they retreated into a cave For 12 years, they stayed there, completely shut off from the outside world. Through some sort of miracle, as common in these stories, a carob tree and a spring appeared in the cave, enabling their survival. They could eat and drink and find sustenance. Every day, they immersed themselves in Torah study and prayer, familiar habits from their previous lives outside of the cave, comforting tasks, perhaps performed as avoidance, becoming an escape, a cave in itself. The Talmud does not paint a picture of what happened before this encounter between Shimon and Yehuda. We don't have a clear view about how the precise global context impacted their feelings, what personal tragedies or challenges they may have been facing. We have no idea what each of them were carrying, but we can imagine it was all too much. Between the crumbling of their world, the failure of their leadership, and an inability to imagine a different and hopefully better reality, they were just carrying too much. We, too, feel the weight of, our wor- of the world in our bones. We have been carrying far too much. I have been carrying too much. You have been carrying too much. And we've been carrying it for far, far too long. Tonight, as we leave 5781 behind, take a moment and recall how it felt last Rosh Hashanah to look at the year ahead, mourning the loss of life, spiritual, emotional, and physical, all while believing that the new year held within it the promise of coming out on the other side of this global pandemic. And here we are, a year later, a year that was supposed to be better And yet, somehow, for some may even seem worse. Sure, maybe long-awaited trips to see loved ones maybe aren't totally postponed anymore. They might look different than how we'd hoped they'd be by now. But it's been a back-to-school season marred by protests and quarantines, with both sides shouting that they have the best interests of the children in mind. A year later, and our country still cannot unite to dismantle its foundational systems of oppression, And we are presently witnessing the criminalization of a woman's right to choose, and on and on and on. It's too much to carry. 
With all we've been carrying, the idea of retreating into a cave with one of our closest friends, with an endless supply of one guilty pleasure distraction, take your pick. Celebrity tabloids, TV streaming services, hey, maybe the Talmud, Wikipedia, it might sound like a dream. Even if we didn't know how long we had to stay there, anything to numb us from reality. And most of us have indulged in some escapes in the last 18 months. And we've learned something, that no matter what fantasy we could dream up to escape the present, we cannot stay in the cave forever. And even if we could, we are not meant to spend our lives in these caves. Shimon and Eleazar couldn't either. The Talmud teaches that when, after 12 years, the emperor who had ordered their deaths died, Elijah the prophet himself arrived at the mouth of the cave and told Shimon and Eleazar that they were no longer in danger. They no longer had to hide from the world. And so they emerged from the cave for the first time in over a decade. They had made it to the moment where they could rejoin society. So what happened? Having been separated from society for such an extended period of time, they experienced a disorienting level of culture shock. They witnessed people engaging in what they would have called mundane tasks, plowing and sowing, activities connected to physical sustenance. Nowhere did they see people engaged in the study of Torah. For men who devoted themselves to study, who sacrificed everything to uphold their faith, they could not grapple with what they saw. Shimon and Eleazar became furious, so much so the Talmud says that everywhere their eyes looked immediately burst into flames. According to this story, their rage literally set the world on fire. How could people waste their energy, they thought? How could they waste their energy and efforts on such meaningless tasks? Torah, Torah, they said, was the only worthwhile endeavor. They were infuriated to see people engage with the task of surviving and not with the task of making meaning. They were filled with self-righteousness and indignation. They had spent 12 years, 144 months, 4,380 sunrises and 4,380 sunsets, with every single one spent enmeshed in study and prayer, the whole time without examining themselves. They expected the world to change instead. As they continued to view everything through eyes of rage instead of eyes of curiosity, God called out to them as they were setting everything aflame. God said, did you emerge from the cave in order to destroy my world? Return to the cave. And so they did. For 12 more months, it is said they again studied and prayed. But something else happened too. After 12 months, God instructed them that it was time to leave the cave once more. At least for Shimon, something changed in him during the course of that year. We are led to believe that perhaps he actually engaged in the task we are here to engage in today, cheshbon hanefesh. He took an accounting of his soul, delving deep, trying to understand why the values he espoused did not match his actions. El Azar, on the other hand, did none of this work. It is said that after these 12 months, everywhere that Rabbi Elazar would strike, Rabbi Shimon would heal. Elazar came out of the cave thinking he was now a sage, but knowledge is not the same as wisdom. Despite all he had learned, he was the same person he was when he went into that cave 13 years before. Shimon spent the first 12 years trying to change the world and then spent the last 12 months trying to change himself. When asking the question, will this year be different, it's a question of will we be like Eleazar or will we be like Shimon? Will we approach everything the way we always have or will we do the self-work to develop a different path? We don't know when we'll emerge from the cave, but the story reminds us no matter how long we stay in one and God willing not another 11 years, you will eventually emerge. How will you emerge from the cave? These two characters also serve as two different models of anger, hot and cold. 
In his book, Changing the World from the Inside Out, A Jewish Approach to Personal and Social Change, Rabbi David Jaffe defines these two types of anger. First, hot anger, he says, is the anger we see overtake Moses as he smashes the first set of the Ten Commandments when he witnesses the scene of the golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai. It is, as Rabbi Beth Clafter puts it, reactive anger, explosive and immediate in order to, as Rabbi Jaffe says, provide temporary relief for uncomfortable feelings. We witness this form of anger daily, often in ourselves. We lash out, we cry, we scream, we comment on articles or social media posts, or we hit that button, read comments, all the while knowing no one has ever hit that button and felt better about themselves or the world as a result. While this type of anger doesn't set the world aflame, it consumes us. It leaves us wondering how this could possibly be the world we live in, how we could possibly hold such differing worldviews from our neighbors or friends. But let me tell you about cold anger. Cold anger, on the other hand, Rabbi Jaffe says, is generative and purposeful. It is born of significant grief with the purpose of setting things right. Or as Rabbi Clafter describes it, it is anger we can sit with. It can create something new. With it, we can seek repair and reconciliation. Like fire, she says, rage can destroy or it can create. It is up to us to decide how to express it and how to harness its power. These holy days give us another name for cold anger. Found in the recitation of the 13 attributes of God, Adonai, Adonai, El Rahum V'chanun, Erech Apayim V'Rav Chesed V'Emet, We say, Adonai, Adonai, God of compassion and patience, slow to anger, loving and true. As beings created in God's image, we look to these attributes as the ideal we strive to embody ourselves. If God contains these attributes, so do we. Focusing in on those words, erech apayim, it's usually translated as slow to anger. Tonight, I want to invite you to interpret it as slowing your anger. This definition of cold anger is also found in the Jewish practice of Musar, in the Midah, in the virtue of patience, in which we cultivate a space between, they say, the match and the fuse. Take a beat, our tradition says. Assess and reassess. What is your anger telling you? This doesn't mean that erech apayim, cold anger, slowing your anger, doesn't start as hot anger. Rabbi Jaffe describes a moment of God's hot anger turning to cold in the aftermath of the golden calf. God declares to Moses, leave me alone so my wrath can burn at them. God wants to destroy the Israelites. Leave me alone. God wants to destroy everything and retreat into a cave. Rabbi Jaffe argues that we can only rage when we feel isolated. And so the text tells us, Moses refused to leave God alone. Instead, Moses reminds God, this is not who you are. You are the God of Abraham and Sarah, of Isaac and Rebekah, of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. You are the God of creation, the God of the covenant, the God of redemption. Moses does not allow God to distance God's self from God's essence. In this moment, God's anger is slowed. It turns from hot to cold, and the path to teshuva opens up the Israelites' relationship with God has the possibility of being mended. The first time Shimon and Eleazar emerged from the cave and saw a world different from what they expected, they were consumed with hot anger. Even while rejoining society, they felt isolated and unseen. Immediately, they destroyed everything in their path. And following their additional year of isolation, when Eleazar still burned with hot anger, Shimon succeeded in learning how to sit with his anger and develop cold anger. Erech Apaim, he slowed his anger. In the end, Shimon taught Eleazar how to take the space to sit with his anger too, and he stopped burning all that he saw. From a young age, we are trained to believe that anger is bad. Harvard Medical School professor Dr. Susan David invites us to retrain ourselves to experience emotions not as good or bad, but rather as signposts. She says our emotions contain flashing lights to things that we care about. We tend not to feel strong emotions about something that doesn't mean anything in our world. If you feel rage when you read the news, that rage is a signpost. 
perhaps that you value equity and fairness. And it's an opportunity to take active steps to shape your life in that direction. She says, when we are open to the difficult emotions, we are able to generate responses that are values aligned. This is the difference between hot and cold anger. Hot anger is anger we do not evaluate, we only feel. Cold anger is anger we become curious about. What is it teaching us about our values and how can we orient our life to live them? Erech apayim, slowing our anger, is what allows us to move the needle in our fight for justice. On this her yard site, we recall the words of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. While we yelled in the comments section, she authored opinions. She was a master of Erech Apaim, of slowing her anger, and by doing so, she managed to secure rights for women and other oppressed peoples. As we recite the words Erech Apaim this high holy day season, let it remind you to slow your anger. Anger can be a force for good, for justice. Anger can allow us to see those signposts flashing brightly, those signposts that help us understand our hearts and move us to action. Like Moses did for God, when you feel anger boiling inside of you, I want you to do something with it. I want you to take a few breaths and think about what sign your anger is trying to send you. What is your body trying to signal to you that you care about so deeply you feel it in your bones? Maybe you won't figure it out in that moment, but take it to a friend. Get angry, process it, and get to work. Your anger is trying to show you what it is you care about and how to get closer to living a life of meaning with clarity around your values. Our High Holy Days can be like a temporary cave of prayer and study, a safe place to find sustenance. But if we emerge on the other side of Yom Kippur unchanged, we have decided this year will not be different. It's nearly time to emerge from the cave. How do you need to show up in these 10 days ahead to connect with yourself, with your anger, those signposts, your values? This may seem strange, but let your anger be your teacher. Recognize your signposts and return to living your core values this year. When we reemerge, let us be like Shimon and use our anger for good. I want to end tonight by bringing your focus to the mosaic on the wall behind me. This congregation has a long history of slowing our anger and turning it into action in this very city. This half circle mosaic, brilliantly designed by our architects to unequivocally state that this is not a cave. There is an outside world. This is not a place to retreat. It is a place to connect to the world that is on the other side of that circle. The other half of that circle is always there, waiting for us to slow our anger just enough to truly be pursuers of peace and justice. It is time for us to emerge. Kenya Hiratzon, may this be God's will.